Welcome to Sacred Realms. Huh? It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast. I'm your host, Lyndon Willoughby. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matt Willoughby. Matt, I don't know how we did it. I don't know what sorcery was involved, but somehow uh, we walked out my back door, and instead of emerging in uh, my own cozy backyard, we uh, came out in the middle of the Florida swamp. I was going to say Amazon rainforest, but Florida swamp works as well because it is gross. Here's the thing. I looked at the weather uh, on my phone and I was trying to figure out if it was going to be an inside night or an outside night. And after weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of like 95 at 1130 p.m., I when I when I saw the weather um, and it said that it was 80 degrees outside, I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, our time is it is time. Here we are. Here's Rafiki with Simba. It is time. Yeah, it turns out it's not time because not. even though it's 80 degrees outside, there's like, it's it's humid enough to where I'm pretty sure I didn't even need to bring water out here with me. I think I could just open my mouth and all my hydration just needs drink it. Be, and just, yeah. nom, 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 nom. just like drink the air. It is gross out here, but that's okay. We are pushing on. We are nothing if not adaptable. Um, are we adaptable? We are very adaptable. I feel like... Uh, our adaptation comes with um, lots of complaining, but that's okay. That's not, to, you know, that's not to say that we can't do it. We're just going to bitch I, about it a I lot. I feel like we deserve to bitch about it if we so desire. I think that you're right. Um, I'm going to cut the bitching short for the moment, though, because I think that what's probably a much more fun thing to do is to introduce the guest that we have got on uh, for this week's episode, who is actually not somebody that we've had the pleasure of interviewing on this show before. That's true. Also, I want to point out that you're jumping into the guest thing way earlier than normal. Is that because it's a new guest or just because you don't want to talk to me tonight? It is definitely mostly because it's a new guest. Mostly, but not entirely. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, introduce the new guest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome onto the show josh of zelda universe another person that we brought over from that side of the world josh how are you doing i'm doing great thanks for having me uh we are super excited to have you on uh obviously we've kind of had a rotating cast of people who have a history with or who are affiliated with zelda universe um cody has been on many times max who's kind of i guess an alum of zelda universe has been on many times um but this is the first time that we've had you on and you've actually been following the show for quite a while um so i'm glad that we could finally find time to make this happen um if, if you wouldn't mind could you give us a rundown real quick of what exactly it is you do over at zelda universe just so people can kind of like i guess categorize your involvement with that site versus like what cody does so i'm kind of uh cody's counterpart in a way um we're not we're not the only two webmasters, uh, but Cody handles the media side of things, and I handle more of the writing and website development. Uh, so most of what you actually see at ZeldaUniverse.net, uh, rather than offsite on YouTube uh, or social media, is stuff that I have more of a hand in. Gotcha. Okay, excellent. So uh, is Cody a bit more of the the social and YouTube guy? Yes, he is. That's all media under his command. We'll say. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, um, we all we all know Cody to be a, a ruthless taskmaster, right? Well, that's accurate. Yeah, definitely ruthless. Um, certainly sarcastic. Um, how long have you been with? Those uh, are the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely they definitely can be. How long have you been with uh, ZU, Joshua? Uh, so I've been uh, part of the ZU team since 2011. Uh, you can actually thank Cody for that particular thing. Uh, and I was around operating my own separate Zelda site before that. And what was that called? Nine years before that. Uh, it was usually called the Temple of Time. Uh, when I finally came into ZU, it was called Zelda Relic. Gotcha. Okay. And is that now defunct? Did it get like rolled into ZU or... Uh, more or less, yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Good stuff. Well, uh, yeah, definitely very happy to have somebody else from from your whole crew on over here. Um, and I, I think you've been 
a you've been a patron and following our show almost since the beginning. Is that right? Uh, close to. I've definitely been following along with the show since around the beginning. I think I think I found it because of Max tweeting about it, uh, and uh, saw the little logo and all that, and was intrigued. Uh, but uh, as far as being a patron, I think that was a couple seasons in or so. So uh, you, I don't remember. And so you and you and Maximum Nichols kind of go back a little ways as well, right? Uh, a little ways, not like he and Melora. Um, I was. Uh, I'm kind of. We'll we'll call them generations. I'm kind of one one Zelda generation behind them. Uh, so I knew of them, and it was more of a looked up to what they had done. <laughs> And uh, wanted to be as successful uh, at the time, but I never actually got to really know them until just the last few years. It's so strange because when we started the show up, we had a, a like a short list of people that we wanted to have on that I just had kind of known from my years of being an active like fan in the Zelda community. And, um, you know, Max was definitely one of them. Uh, that was before I even really knew him very well. I think I, I had not really spoken to Max at all. Um, until we started recording for the show. Um, but I, I did know Cody a little bit. And so they were, they, they were definitely both on my short list. Um, and so, and, and I had no idea that they had any familiarity with each other at all. And so then I get Max on and I just, I, I start to see him retweeting all of Melora's history of Hyrule stuff. And I was thinking, oh, well, this person seems really cool. So I reach out to Melora separately. Basically what this means is that I think about half of our recurring guests on this show were all friends and involved with each other long before being guests on this show. And Matt and I didn't know about any of it at all and just completely separately invited all of y'all to be a part of this, which has been a real joy for us personally. But like, what are the odds? You know, I would assume very low. I'm not complaining. No, not at all. It is a small world, Australia's especially in the Zelda community. <laughs> Did you just say Australia is not that far away? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that checks out. Cody, Cody has been here multiple times. <laughs> okay. Which is one of the things that is so like disappointing about the fact that we sort of fired this up uh, during the pandemic, because I think if, if this had like predated the pandemic by like a year or so, there's a very real chance that we would have met Cody in person at least once by now. But oh, that so like this fun. is a spoiler, but Cody was actually here right before everything shut down. Uh, if he had if he had planned his trip like a month later, he might have been a little stuck. Uh, he was here in late January 2020 and most of December, the Well, pr the prior year. Well, here's what we're going to do. If Cody actually manages to make it out from Australia, I know that's still not the easiest thing in the world to do, but uh, if that ever happens, then we're going to do a we're going to do a whole roundtable episode with everyone recording in person. And that's just going to be a, that's going to be a grand old time. If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cody is very good at derailing conversations. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, that just sounds like good pod. That sounds like the making of content right there. But I guess we'll see whenever we get around to it. Um, regardless, we definitely have got some game to talk about here tonight. And uh, I know that um, of all the guests that have been on so far this season, you are probably the one who has got the most upfront familiarity with The Legend of Zelda. Uh, uh, our, our previous guests... You know, Mike, Max, Matt, and myself, we we have nothing here. This is all brand new for us. But I know uh, this is definitely not your first trip around the block with this game. No, I've been playing it uh, the majority of my life, but uh, but I didn't really grow up with it per se. If you had to put a number on the number of times that you've played The Legend of Zelda, just ballpark, what do you think it would be? As in finished it? <laughs> um, um, I, I, uh, man, that's so hard. I'm going to say yes for the purposes of this conversation, but I feel like... Yeah, because like, I've played the first dungeon probably a hundred times. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> just, just, you know, starting up the game to play it a little bit. Uh, but uh, as far as finished it, I don't, I don't know, eight or ten times, uh, which actually is kind of low for me when it comes to replaying Zelda games. But... Uh, I've been playing it more uh, in recent years than I did before. 
Is that just due to ease of accessibility? Partially, yeah. Uh, you know, definitely there were, it was on it was on the GameCube, right? And I and I've got that disc to play it. Uh, that was probably the first time I really played it was on the GameCube. Uh, even though I've got a cartridge on the shelf um, for the NES, but uh, but yeah, now that it's on the Switch, especially, I mean, I'll, I'll play this game over a weekend, just you know, while the TV's on. I think that Matt and I are not, are sort of realizing now that we could very easily have done the exact same thing. Um, and in, in later playthroughs, like if I ever come back to this game, I think that's probably how it's going to happen. So a thing that we do on this show that I'm sure you, I'm sure you know, uh, is whenever we have a new guest on, we kind of do a little rundown of that person's history with Zelda. And so we're going to go ahead and do that real quick. Um, I would like for you to tell us one, which of the games that you've played, and I'm sure that answer is going to be all of them. So just feel free to, to, to get that one out of the way quickly if you want. It's uh, all of them. Yeah, okay, cool. I figured. Multiple uh, times, all of them. There you go. I love to hear it. So, okay, of those, which is your favorite if you had to pick and which is your least favorite? Uh, so my favorite is and probably always will be A Link to the Past. Uh, okay. My, uh, my least favorite currently is Spirit Tracks, uh, but uh, I, I do replay them all the time and reshuffle my, my list. Uh, well, and so, two years ago, Spirit Tracks was not at the bottom of the list. So. Can I ask what it dethroned? Uh, it, previously, I had Oracle of Seasons at the bottom uh, until I recently replayed it a couple times. Interesting. So um, those are both games that I have not played. I, I've played most of the games on our list, and I have not played Spirit Tracks or Oracle of Seasons. So um, yeah, and I, I think you've said this too on on this show. But like, I'm nitpicking to make a list at all. Like when I say Spirit <laughs> Tracks is my least favorite, I'm not saying it's a bad game. Like if you handed it to me and said I'm stuck here playing it, great. Let's play it. Well, that's the whole premise of the show is that a, a bad Zelda game, um, a bad Nintendo made and published Zelda game does not exist. Uh, I think we're going to be putting that premise to the test when we get to Zelda 2. But I know that's also one that you esteem very highly. So, Yes. Uh, currently number six on my list right after Breath of the Wild. Wow. I would say Wait, you have Breath of the Wild at number six. He has Breath of the Wild at number Breath five. Breath of the Wild oh. at number five. Okay. Whew. I still think Be that, clear, that my list is very nostalgia. It's my favorites list. It is not the objective. Let's discuss it list. You all make at the end of each season. <laughs> Gotcha. I still feel like, I mean, I feel like a lot of people probably make their lists the same way. And I would be willing to bet that your arrangement is probably pretty unique um, just by virtue of the fact that you have Zelda 2 so high up there. I know that that's, you know, even among people who play Zelda heavily for the nostalgia, I know a lot of people just don't have the patience for that game. So it is an acquired taste. For sure. <laughs> uh, it, is, I know. it is not this, it is not like any other Zelda game. Uh, uh, it's just different. I wonder uh, if we'll acquire it, Matt. I wonder, and I know that when we <laughs> when we met for the first time a while ago, um, you said that you were the Zelda Two apologist among the Zelda Universe staff, and I think that uh, that is pretty self evident in your ranking alone. Yeah, um, Josh is definitely helping us to organize and plan how we're going to be progressing through Zelda Two when we get to that game later on in this season, uh, because Matt and I are just like. It would be the blind leading the blind over here, and we want to we want to construct a good a good product. So um, definitely expect to see Josh back when we get uh, back around to that game. Thank you uh, for giving us a little background on your history with this series, Josh. Um, I'm sure that uh, you know I'm I'm sure that we're going to get tangentially uh, much more into that as we kind of go through our discussion. Um, so in order to get to that point in the episode as quickly as possible, I'm going to go ahead and knock out some housekeeping in just a second. Before I do that, I feel like I would be remiss. I, I had a quandary before we started recording this one, Matt. Oh, do tell me your quandary, please. I, you know, we haven't done news in a while. 
Because there hasn't been news. Right? There has been no news. No, yeah. Notably, a lack of news, and as, as some people might say. <laughs> quite notable in its absence, yeah. So, um, yeah, and and we're not just going to sit here and, and spout every old rumor just, just for the sake of it. Because we do pride ourselves on not propagating fake news. Right, as much as possible. That being said, there's a big old rumor that's floating around today, and I want to stress just to to an incredible degree before I repeat this. Even though it comes from seemingly reliable sources that we're talking about Nintendo here, and this may not be anything at all, so it's probably best not to get your hopes up. However, just because uh, this kind of feeds directly into Matt's and my upcoming ability to make content for this show, I felt like it bore repeating. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, The uh, rumor that we're addressing is, of course, that uh, this afternoon there there was a lot of talk going around that Nintendo had a direct planned for some time in September, and that a major part of this direct was going to be a little bit more news on their plans for Zelda and would include um, release dates for the Switch releases of Twilight Princess and Wind Waker. And as much as we l- would love more than anything... Would make our lives so easy. For that to be true, we do not give credence to nor are put our name behind these rumors. We are just reporting on the fact that these rumors exist and have circulated both upon Twitter... Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, our own Discord channel, everywhere. You know, the rumors abound. Josh, did you did you see this going around today? I did. I actually wrote something in the Discord about it earlier. Uh, oh, well, cool. That I sure- feel I feel like this rumor has just existed, I don't know, for 5 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh I'm not going to say it'll never happen. I actually think it will happen at some point. Uh but just I don't see anything today that was new evidence that it's going to happen soon. Uh, I feel like I could have written that art, the same article today and just put it out there and had just as much, you know, just as much reliability uh, as anyone else. But hold on one second. It makes sense for those games to be there. Yeah, I definitely agree, and I think that this is really, it's kind of like the Metroid <clears throat> Prime remastered trilogy, right? Yeah. Like, yep. this, is, mm-hmm. this, is a, this is a thing that is real, it is sitting on a shelf somewhere, and God only knows when it's going to come out, but at some point it will, and until then we're just going to get a new batch of, like, uh, you know, rumors and whatnot every two to three months that are that are that swear up and down that it's coming out before the end of the year because two or three months sure. ago we were even talking about rumors that we had heard about a late summer uh nintendo direct that could have been very zelda focused and that didn't exactly pan out for us so you know like you said every two or three months something is going to come up that's going to get everybody in a partial tizzy and it will more often than not amount to nothing so fingers crossed knock on wood uh hail Mm. mary all the things whatever you believe in to bring good luck good juju etc uh we hope that this one is true so one thing i'll say one thing i'll say is that if we take it as true that breath of the wild 2 is coming out in the spring of 23 i think that it makes sense for nintendo to release these two games on the switch this holiday season um just to kind of fill to fill that gap to create some buzz uh for the switch around you know around the holidays zelda's big wind waker and twilight princess are big those would do great for them um skyward sword is proof of that it's it's re-release on the switch did quite well for nintendo so um i guess with that in mind I see where this is credible. Um, I, I have a, a half of a shred of hope that this might be true. Uh, I mean, what do you think are the odds, Josh, that this is actually something that's going to happen in September? 50, 50. <laughs> uh, like, I, I do think there, I think there's a direct coming from just a news standpoint, right? Like I, uh, they're out of games basically. Splatoon's about to come out, at least at the time of this recording. Uh, it's about to come out. And uh, we know Bayonetta's coming out, and Pokemon Company kind of does its own thing. We know that's coming out. But that's kind of it that I can remember uh, from a first-party Nintendo kind of standpoint. And I feel like now is generally when they would fill us in on mm-hmm. you know, one or two more things for this year just to fill in the gaps in the schedule and tell us kind of what's up the first few months of next year. 
Yeah. Uh, it, so it's like it's about time for there to be some news. Yeah. They could very well just drop it all on Twitter one afternoon and not give us a presentation. But uh, but I f- it, usually when they're talking Zelda, I, I usually they put it in a presentation. They yeah. did drop Age of Calamity a random morning on Twitter. Uh, yeah. They so. did, but I don't know if you can. I know it's Zelda technically. I don't know if that fits the bill in the way that you're kind of <laughs> talking about it. Right. Like, like I do really hope the Wind Waker is a thing happening very soon. I love that game a lot. Uh, I like it more than Breath of the Wild. Uh, it has only ever existed on two more or less failed platforms. Uh, it never, it's never gotten its fair shot. Uh, so I, w- I want people to get to play it now that we've got a Nintendo console that can play it that people actually own. I'm going to upset. Uh, so one last point before we get out of here, I'm just going to say, Matt, I don't know if I ever vocalized this to you before, but to me, Wind Waker, whenever we get around to playing it, is the game that has the most potential to completely upset my entire ranking. Like, <gasps> Really? Do you think it has the potential to become the uh, heir to the throne? No, I I accord, I played it two or three times, and I I love the hell out of it. I don't think that I according <coughs> according to what I remember, I don't think that I love it enough to where it'll unseat Breath of the Wild for me. But anything else after that is completely fair game. Like I couldn't tell you right now. I think there's a solid chance that that I might rank it above like Ocarina of Time and others. You know, um, so I think the I think the big fight for me is going to be. What is my second place after Breath of the Wild? Is it Majora's Mask or Wind Waker? That is shocking. So um, we'll see. The Wind well, Waker so is excellent. Currently, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of the same ways, Breath of the Wild is excellent. Like people, I know folks have told you that the Legend of Zelda is very close to Breath of the Wild as as far as like design philosophy. The Wind Waker can be too if you if you let it. <laughs> yeah, I think like. Wind Waker's always been the one that I was most excited to play um, as soon as we started even talking about this podcast. Um, And I'm very excited to get to it. I have a very hard time imagining a world where Wind Waker trumps Majora's Mask or Skyward Sword for me. Like, Majora's Mask is kind of the one for me that I think has the most potential to really reshuffle the top four games yeah in my opinion and you know i don't want to i'm not speaking anything into being here i think we've been pretty fair and pretty objective minded in our ranking so far and i think that we're going to continue to do that as best as we can so you know not giving any spoilers for any rankings future uh to now but like i just i have a hard time imagining a game that i enjoy more than majora's mask or skyward sword and breath of the wild and Ocarina of time. Like those, those are my top four bar, bar none. And man, imagining a game that could upset that is, uh, Ooh, exciting and tantalizing. Well, one day we will answer all of those spicy questions. We're going to get around to it. Um, that of course is not something that we're going to be doing today, but I'm glad that we could have a little side conversation about it because, uh, yeah, you know, it's fun to talk about what the future holds. Good pod is all about a meaty structure with a lot of very delicious side conversation. There you go. This was a delicious side conversation. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> mm, nom, 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 <laughs> As much like the Goria says in Dungeon 7. <laughs> grumble, grumble. Grumble, grumble. Yeah. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, y'all, let's get into some housekeeping. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly re-examination of The Legend of Zelda one <clears throat> little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week we play a new section of a Zelda game, and then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button, be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are very greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. If you want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod to get access to our Discord channel, of which Josh is a frequently con- uh, frequent tr- contributing member. 
uh, listener mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Uh, additionally, one of the benefits that all Master Sword patrons and above receive is that we read their names every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are George, Mike, Dylan, Ali, Lennon, Leviticus, Kolku, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Keep It Going, Pod, Dante, Gep, Mary, Brittany, Davey, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Tyler, Ben, Daniel, Nick D underscore TV, Travis, Christian, Jonathan, Hyrule Interviews, Garrett, and Drew. We appreciate all of those people so much we could not make this podcast without them. They are truly the very best. But without further ado, let's get into... The Sacred Realms Rundown and talk about what we played. The Sacred Realms Rundown is, of course, a six-part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel. Today, we're covering The Legend of Zelda Chapter 4, uh, in which we've got two more dungeons, which would be Dungeon 6 and 7. Part 1 of The Sacred Realms Rundown is, of course, the plot recap as read by Matt. Matt, take it away. We leave the grueling fifth dungeon, and we head off to increase our own power before moving along to collect the rest of the Triforce. The most immediate need is a more powerful sword to complete the improved defense offered by the Blue Ring. We heard tell that a magical sword resided near the cemetery at the far west end of the Death Mountain foothills. Following this handy rumor, we head that direction post-haste, but we quickly find ourselves completely lost, wandering among the woods. We wander around the paths in these lost woods, and eventually find our way out, after heading north, then west, then south, and then finally west once more. We come to the cemetery area, which is completely swarming with Lynels and new ghost enemies that we call Genie. After vanquishing the various foes, we explore the graveyard and eventually find a hidden entrance beneath one of the tombstones, which leads to yet another old man guarding a sword. This sword, however, exacts a heavy price, and the old man warns that we must master the sword before we can wield it. Luckily, across our long journey so far, we have increased our life force to over 12 hearts and are able to wield this magical blade, which has four times the attack power of our beginning sword. Moving on from the graveyard, we head east and discover underneath another Armos statue a bracelet that floods our limbs with power. This power bracelet allows us to move heavy stones and lift heavy objects, and using it, we uncover a portal near the graveyard, which warps us to multiple places around Hyrule. However, none of these places land us at the sixth dungeon, so we set out to find it. Luckily for us, it lies directly next to the cemetery, and we find it fairly quickly. Entering its depths, we begin to move along inside and are confronted again by new and powerful enemies. The most fearsome and damaging of these foes are the powerful magic-wielding Wizrobes, which throw magical power around and teleport when not in combat. The yellow Wizrobes fall to one stroke of our new magical blade, but their more powerful brethren are tough as nails. Very early on in the dungeon, we find an old man that tells us to aim for the Eye of Goma, which means nothing to us at this moment, but we think will be helpful later on. The enemies in this dungeon are more dense than we have seen before, and we even fight another Gleok dragon towards the top of the dungeon. Gleok was guarding a magic wand, however, and we can now use this handy item to cast spells back at the wizards throughout the dungeon. Later in this dungeon, we find a second old man that tells us there are secrets where fairies don't live, which is entirely unhelpful as fairies don't live in pretty much everywhere around Hyrule. Putting this riddle aside for now, we head further into the dragon-shaped dungeon. This dungeon's boss is a gigantic spider-esque monster, which we only assume is named Goma, after the advice of the old man. The spider monster shoots beams of energy and rushes forward to face us, but following the old man's advice, we aim for its eye, and the monster falls to our very first arrow. As surprised as we are relieved, we head to claim the peace of the Shattered Triforce. Remembering the words of the second old man from the last dungeon, we start our way back towards the plains of Hyrule. We remember, vaguely, an empty pond that looked like it should have been a fairy fountain. 
We head that way and find the deserted pond, patrolled by a lone moblin. Making short work of this peon, we sit by the still waters to ponder our path forward. As we sit idling, we decide to play our flute to pass the time and hopefully jog our memory. As soon as we play the first melody, the lake begins to drain and it reveals a secret pathway to the seventh dungeon. This dungeon is flush with enemies as well, but none are new to us as we explore this dank crypt. We fight multiple dig dodgers, however, and many rooms are full of enemies with no immediately recognizable benefit. Additionally, almost every room has at least one wall that succumbs to a bomb, and we quickly exhaust our supply of explosives. As we move around, many of the enemies drop more bombs, so we continue to blast away at every wall we can find. We find another old man with a hint, as he says, a secret lies in the tip of the nose, which we assume to mean a portion of this dungeon. Consulting the map, we head towards the most northeastern point we can reach. Along the way, we find another merchant who sells us another upgraded bomb bag, moving our inventory up to a whopping 16 bundles of explosive joy. After fighting through a truly astounding number of enemies, we reach the secret and find a red candle waiting for us. This is an upgrade to our blue candle and can be used as many times as we desire without needing to recharge. And with our new pyrotechnic display in hand, we move deeper into the crypt. At the middle eastern section, we come across another iteration of our very first boss. Aquamentus awaits us, and without any upgrades to its attack or defense, we make quick work of it. Our magic shield blocks its fire attacks, and our magical sword cuts right through its defenses. And we head straight into the room where the seventh piece of the Triforce is housed, and claim it for ourselves. As we set our sights on the last leg of our journey, we are secure in the knowledge that we have increased our power to the point that our earliest challenges are now no more than trivialities. But on the flip side, we know this means that Ganon must have something truly horrible in store for us. Girding ourselves for the final grind ahead, we set off to find the last piece of the Triforce and face our ultimate foe. This has been the plot recap as read by Matt. Let's get into part two, which is our takes, in which we talk about this section of the game and how it made us feel. I'm going to uh, start off with a quick observation here real quick, which is that uh, in order to get to both of these dungeons, we have got two mainstays of, I guess, the Zelda universe that that happened for the first time here. One of which is that we have to traverse the Lost Woods and kind of proceed through it in certain specific directions in order to break our way out of the endless cycle, right? Uh, and then the other is that we've got to drain a giant body of water to get to a dungeon. Um, so those two things together uh, recur throughout the entire rest of the Zelda series. So it was definitely very welcome, I think, to see them here. Um, I don't know, like, did you... Matt, like when you got to the point where you drain the lake to kind of get down to that dungeon, did it did it kind of feel like coming home a little bit to you? It definitely felt familiar in a way that much of this game has not so far. So I, I think it was enjoyable. It just draws me back to my main problem with this game where we not playing it the way that we're playing it. And that is how in the hell am I supposed to know that this is what you're supposed to do when I get here? Like, in what way does the old man's hint in Dungeon 6 lead me to this place? And in what way does that hint tell me in any way, shape, or form that I'm supposed to sit here and play my flute in order to drain this pond? Like, it makes no sense. So, you are interpreting the the hint as... So, when, when the old man says uh, there are secrets where fairies don't live, you're interpreting that to mean that since in the next screen over from the pond that we drain there's an identical looking pond that has a fairy right well and, and this and one the, doesn't and both fairy ponds in the game look exactly the same and they look exactly like this one yeah there's just not a fairy here so like i get that i guess like to a certain extent that makes a certain amount of sense but again taking the next logical the next leap here from i have found this pond now what do i do so josh my question you for know you what the whistle does other than soothe Link after he gets hit by a bubble, stun Dig Dodger, and then apparently drain this lake? It teleports you between the entrances of the dungeons. 
Okay. It's a fast travel mechanic. Like so from the overworld? This Yes, for the overworld. You can just play it anywhere and it, it will take you. It'll it'll take you to Eagle and then Moon and Manji and it just takes you in order. Uh, I don't think it takes you to dungeons you haven't been to. So I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. Uh, it, it's possible it just drops you in front of the lake eventually, and then you're like, why am I here? Uh, but I think it's supposed to be a hint that if there's a secret and you're trying to find a dungeon, uh, that you just play the flute, and it's it's supposed to tie together that it's a dungeon-related item, right, that takes you to dungeons, gets you into dungeons. Uh, but without the instruction manual to explain to you that the whistle does that... Uh, <laughs> You don't know that it does that. And I'm wondering if this, man, was, this has to be in Phil's guide, and I just didn't. It is in Phil's guide, which is the only way I knew to do it. Okay, gotcha, cool. So, uh, clearly, so this is kind of a recurring thing that we have had happen throughout this season with people who have more uh, context with this game than we do, Josh, which is that Matt and I will be here like, how are we supposed to know to do this? And everyone's like, well, this thing over here that if you find it, like, gives you a hint, and then you know that kind then you kind of like have something to go on that you can do this other thing and um and those have uniformly gone right over mats in my heads absolutely and i'm actually reading i have the the official nintendo guide or a uh, game guide thing manual manual pulled up yeah. and its description of the whistle is as follows a really oh, hold on where to go there we go. A really mysterious <laughs> magical item. Use it and it'll amaze you with what it can do. Sorry, I have that manual open also for reference. And cool. I saw that right before you read it. I was like, yeah, wow. Yeah, cool. Thanks, man. That, that's super great. <laughs> were, were you amazed, Matt? I was apparently amazed. I don't know. <laughs> were you paralyzed by its majesty? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, great holy one. <laughs> We've already so, done this reference. We can't do it again. We've yeah. done this in a past, past episode. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. <laughs> So to be like perfectly honest, a lot of this, uh, like I did not ever come into this game blind. Uh, like a, a lot of this, like I had a player's guide when I was a kid before I had the game. Uh, it was a it was a bonus guide in the back of my Link to the Past guide. Uh, and so I used to just read it. And so I kind of already knew how to do the first few dungeons by memory before I ever played the game. So a lot of these things I, I never had to decipher myself. Uh, they were just things that I knew. Gotcha. Um, so I guess, so moving moving past the, the whistle or the flute or whatever you call it, um, and going to the Lost Woods, is there any hint in this game that tells us the correct order of screens to clear that yes. challenge. There is a, I, I, I don't know where it is for a very good reason, uh, but I know there is a cave. If you go in the cave, someone will just tell you the order. Uh, you don't actually have to go through the lost woods to make it to the dungeon. So I usually just don't, I don't remember the way through the dungeon uh, or through the lost woods rather. Uh, you can reach that dungeon going through the mountain instead, which has Lionels and harder enemies, uh, but you can just go north instead of going through the forest. Gotcha. Okay. And that and that's definitely true. Um, and I think looking back at it now, that definitely would have been the easier way to do it, and we just didn't. But yeah, that that's totally a valid point. So I guess let's talk generally about everything that we kind of do in this section of the game. Um, Josh, where, where are you kind of at with all of the stuff that happens here. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I think we mentioned before we started recording that the overworld stuff tends to start feeling pretty samey after a while. Um, is there anything that we kind of do here that stands out to you and, and made it more or less fun? So, <clears throat> sorry. So there's a, uh, you talked about getting the sword uh, and the power bracelet. Uh, and both of those are like really big hidden items to find. Uh, the power bracelet is another item where it's just not immediately apparent what it does, uh, but it's another fast travel item. Uh, like the game actually just from the very first Zelda game, they had fast travel built in to like, really it's, it's probably more like warp points is how Nintendo thought of it. Like going through a warp point in super Mario brothers. Uh, and, uh, so you get those kind of things, but you have to ex really explore to find them. Like I, I'm not aware of any hint 
leading you to the power bracelet. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing that stands out that uh, uh, maybe is not, uh, has not been missed by you all is that the swords, uh, and especially the magical sword at the end, they directly reference that in Breath of the Wild, uh, yep. needing a certain number of hearts to get the swords. Uh, so that's just a nice connection. Uh, that th- This part always makes me think about Breath of the Wild now, and Breath of the Wild always makes me think about getting the magical sword. <laughs> Yeah, I think that one really stood out strongly to me as soon as I like I, I picked it up and didn't know that I needed a certain number of parts until I went and read some of the sub notes on Phil's guide. Like I had to use Phil's guide to get through the Lost Woods to get to the cemetery and find the right headstone. And I was like, ah, I know that, that that's how I know where the magical sword is. I just went and picked it up. And then as I was kind of wandering around, I read some of the sub notes and it was like, you need tw- at least 12 hearts to pick up this sword. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You need 13 hearts to pick up the master sword in Breath of the Wild. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was Uh, a really cool connective tissue there. But but this section of the overworld uh, where you are, you've kind of got most of the items at this point. Uh, Basically, the entire overworld is is more than open to you at this point. Uh, So it's really just about finding the more well hidden secrets, Um, like the like the power bracelet and the magical sword actually do require looking around to find them. Uh, yeah. And the only reason you know they're in the game at all is the title screen demo with all the items or the manual. Yeah, definitely. Because I don't think that there's, at least I have not found a hint that leads you to the magical sword the same way that you get one that leads you to the white sword. Yeah, I don't know of one. Okay. Um, I will say that, so last week's episode, I said that I had kind of made my life intentionally harder <laughs> going into Dungeon 5 by not picking up, like I found the magical sword and was like, oh, I think I want this game to still be kind of difficult for a little while and didn't get it and then immediately regretted that because Dungeon 5 was Blue Dark Nut City. Um, <laughs> uh, <bleh>. so the, <laughs> right, so the very first thing that I did when I booted up the game this week was <clears throat> went and got that damn sword. Um, and, and you know, I'm happy happy that I did that. I, I think that there was nothing in this section of game that challenged me the same way that the blue dark nuts did. So maybe last week really was the, the point where I should have gotten into that. But um, I did get the magic sword. I really like the sprite for the magical sword, like as it sits in your inventory. It's it's like a little it's a very small artistic thing. But the wooden sword and the white sword, they they're both very simple looking sprites and they just point straight up and down. But the magic sword has like this cool it's like tilted and it just looks a little more badass when it's sitting in your inventory i thought that was neat it is yeah it's a, it's a better sprite design uh than than the wooden and white swords for sure matt wh- where were you at kind of just generally this week yeah uh so it was good it it, it unlocked one of two sections of the map i haven't been to the only section of the map i have not been to at this point is where the final dungeon is uh at the very northwestern section of the map where you enter into death mountain cavern um or whatever it's called in this game um and so like i was glad to finally make my way through the lost woods find the cemetery get that magical sword because you're right linden i immediately regretted not having a more powerful offensive weapon in uh, dark nut city last week so um i was very glad to get that i did have to backtrack here in order to get the first bomb bag upgrade so i had to re-enter blue dark nut city which i did not love um but you know we do these things to get upgraded bomb bags more more <laughs> explosive bundles of joy. Exactly. Exactly. I'm glad that you didn't forget to go back and do that because I think in uh, Dungeon 7, that probably helped you very much having that increased bomb capacity. It was invaluable. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think uh, you hit the nail on the head there, Josh. We really have basically filled in the map at this point, and now we're honestly just kind of cruising towards towards the end of this game. Not necessarily on autopilot, but, you know, we're definitely... I, I think that our next episode, which is the second to last episode of the season, um, is going to be mostly just dungeon map. Like, we don't have a lot of 
stuff to get up to outside of the last two dungeons at this point. Well, with that having been said, let's go ahead and get into part three, which is the dungeon map where we analyze this week's dungeon from mechanics to music and more. Uh, We've got two dungeons again this week. We have got dungeon six, which is dragon and dungeon seven, which is demon. Let's go ahead and talk about dragon first. Um, Josh, I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, Anything that feels notable about this dungeon specifically? Wizard robes. Yeah, that was the first thought that I had as well. So yeah. glad we're all on a page there. Yep. Yep, me too. Um, classic Zelda enemy gets their first appearance here. Um, Technically, all Zelda enemies get their first appearance Well, here. but in this dungeon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. Thank Sorry, you. I had to. I had it's to. the first game. Yes, it's the first time for everything. But yes, in this dungeon, the whiz robes appear for the first time. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I just had to. Golly. Just had to. Why? Oh man, it was such Why? a. It was you. You gave me such an such a layup, <clears throat> which I know you don't understand because you're not a sportsman. I know what a layup <laughs> is. <What> the, <laughs> leave me alone. Golly, you're horrible. Uh, I feel you're a, the worst. I feel a feisty tonight. Um, yeah, so the whiz robes definitely, man, tell you what, we've mentioned Phil's artwork in uh, his hand-drawn guide several times. The uh, the art that he did for the whiz robes is really stinking cool. He made these guys look awesome. Yeah, they, they look kind of terrifying in a lot of ways. They look very um, Aghanim. It was kind of what I thought when I saw, uh, specifically the red one. He looks very Aghanim. I like it a lot. I don't know, uh, Josh, if you have Phil's guide up, but his... Uh, oh, I do, yeah. Yeah, his his oh. renderings and drawings of enemies and dungeons and um, vistas within The Legend of Zelda have given me such an appreciation for the game above and beyond <clears throat> what I think I would have experienced without them. Like, they, <clears throat> they give me a mental picture to rely on as I progress through this 8-bit... Yes, eight bit world that has almost none of it, and man, it's just really it, it adds a it adds a dimension mm-hmm. that is making this game, I think, so much better than we anticipated it being. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a question for you, uh, Josh. Is Dungeon Six this game's fire dungeon? Uh, that never really occurred to me, but I guess all of the liquid is red. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's difficult to really place themes on a lot of the dungeons in this game. Uh, they all have like a different color palette to them, uh, but there's not any, you know, there's no trees or obvious fire to denote a forest temple or a fire temple. Um, but, uh, so no, like that, that had never occurred to me. Uh, like I, I honestly kind of think of it as the graveyard dungeon and that's because it's near the graveyard. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So, it's almost like the Shadow Temple more than the Fire Temple. Right. Or you know, Dungeon, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I, I totally get where you're coming from there. I think, I, I guess I just sort of got that because, like you said, all the rivers or gaps or whatever they are, the things you cross with the ladder are red where they've previously been uh, blue, and the walls and floors of the dungeon are brown. So I was sitting here thinking like, okay, Fire Dungeon, I guess. This is it. Yay. I mean, it's called Dragon also, and... With a fire dragon breathing dragon. Fire. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that puts together. If you want to take it a step further, you can say Volvagia is a dragon. Yeah. I mean, I think we can we can kind of take this any which way. I think Goma being the main boss here <clears throat> would kind of go against fire dungeon and more towards the graveyard shadowy. But this is, again, us putting expectations upon a game based on things that we've already played, Mm -hmm. namely Ocarina of Time uh, and Skyward Sword to another extent. Um, So, you know, I think I don't necessarily think that that's what the designers were going for, but I see how us coming at it from that angle can impose that upon it. Yeah. Some things that I thought were really interesting about the layout of this dungeon are that one, um, we have a very indirect route from the beginning of the dungeon to the boss. Uh, The boss is actually only accessible by uh, finding a staircase, um, and it takes you to another corner of the dungeon. Um, and that's the only way that you can really get over there and beat the boss and get the piece of the Triforce. So that's, I can definitely see that being a very interesting obstacle to overcome, um, where you're kind of just trying to proceed through the dungeon as you, as the layout would appear that you're supposed to, but then you get kind of up towards where I guess the head of this dragon would be. Um, and then there's nowhere else to go. 
Um, I thought that that was an interesting little bait and switch. Yeah, yeah I think this it, is the first time there's a ladder that leads to another ladder and not just into a room with an item. Yeah, I agree. Like I got I having Phil's guide up, I I kind of knew that I wasn't going to walk into the final boss room when I got to the head of the dragon, but had I not had that, even if I were just using the dungeon map itself and I maybe didn't have the compass, would have been kind of confusing because even most of the dungeons up to now, the boss room is at a terminal section of the map, right? It is at either one of the corners or the very far eastern or western edge, right? And this one, you get to that terminal edge at the far east and it kind of shoots you over to... Uh, another place where you have to then maneuver around a little bit more. So that was, that was a new uh, interesting way of using a mechanic that was introduced in the last dungeon, I think, or maybe the dungeon before Uh, the last dungeon, dungeon five, which is the, that connective tissue of underground um, caverns more or less. And I, I, I liked that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, of course, we do have a mini boss again in this dungeon, which is just a reprise of a boss fight from earlier in the game. It's another Gleok, which is no harder or easier than the last one was. I mean, it's uh, didn't this uh, one have three heads? It has more heads. Yeah, this one has three heads. Boom. I knew it. didn't even notice. I just breezed right through this guy. So I Gleok uh, is not particularly difficult unless you are too cautious. <laughs> or you don't have if, the magic shield. I can see it being hard if you don't have the magic well, shield. Uh, if you try to if you try to dodge every fireball really carefully and you know hide in the corner, Gliok is pretty hard. If you just run in and start hacking away, uh, it's over quickly. <laughs> Yeah, especially with the blue ring where his physical damage to you does like I think half a heart when he hits you. So it's really and at this point you have 12 13ish hearts. So and it's over in what four swings, which you can do your swings faster than he does damage. So yeah, it's it's not exactly a uh, masterclass in combat difficulty. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to swing back around to that point here in a second once we get to the boss. But for now I want to talk about the item that we get in this dungeon, which is the magic wand. And Josh, I'm going to need you to give me some information on this item because my first impression of it is that it is both weaker and less useful than other iterations of this item in later Zelda games. I never use it for anything <laughs> ever. Yeah, I mean, I had the it's exact same thought. It's just a thing thought. you get. Yeah. Uh, like, th- the game doesn't have any kind of, like, lighting a torch puzzle, like that. There's or hitting a switch across a gap. Like, it, they hadn't gotten that far with the dungeon design. It's, it's a purely offensive, just-for-fun item that you don't actually need. Uh, so it's just fun. Like, if you want to shoot things across the screen, you can now. Uh, but... But can it go across the screen? Because I didn't feel like it had much range to it. Like I felt, oh, uh, and it, this may just it be may me. Not. Yeah, I just like I, the couple times I used it. Because after I got it, I was trying to use it against some enemies just to see how effective it was. And I felt like it went five pixels ahead of you, maybe. So not even as far as the not upgraded boomerang, and it just did not do much. And I was so, like very underwhelmed by this item. So. I don't want to spoil future episode, but there's a little more to it uh, that it essentially has an upgrade. Uh, I still don't use it, <laughs> but uh, but it does get better. I think the thing that's most interesting to me about it is that this is the dungeon that we meet the Wizrobes for the first time, and then the item that we get from the dungeon is essentially like a Wizrobe left its wand in this room, and we go pick it up. Because you shoot the same thing the Wizrobes shoot, you know? <clears throat> Right. It's, it's a cool thematic decision. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's, uh, you know, that wears off just as soon as you realize that there are uh, a myriad of better ways to, like, tackle enemies than using this. But but hey, you have got you have got the weapon of the enemy now. So neat. Although I guess we already did. We got the boomerang from the Gurria. So, yeah, that's true. 
Uh, yeah, it was like, it's fine, I guess, is kind of where I'm landing with it. I know just from reading ahead, both on the uh, official game guide and on Phil's guide that we get a magic book in one of the future dungeons. I don't know which one that is supposedly gives you a different magical power. I'm curious to see what that looks like, but I'm not hopeful that it is anything worth noting. I will say, in fairness, if we're talking about items that do ranged damage in this game... Uh, I have gotten to a point now where I've gotten some items that I purchased with rupees, you know, blue ring, bait, um, bomb bag, etc. And they're all decently expensive. Um, and so I will say that I am running lower on rupees than I typically do in Zelda games at this point. And going back to the discussion we had last week about your um, arrow economy being directly tied to the amount of rupees that you have, I can definitely see there being a case for like, you know, this is a good thing to have around if your bow is not there for you to use. Um, I think that's probably its best intended use case. Yeah, I think that's true. Does this utilize any sort of ammo economy or is it just an infinite use? Because I didn't notice that it was depleting anything from me as I was it, it's, swinging it. It's infinite use. Okay, sweet. So I guess that's that's good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think good arrows ideas. move faster and farther. Right, for sure. You you pay for it, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, and, and yeah, I I feel like arrows are just stronger. Also, uh, like I would, I would never think to use the magic wand to fight Paul's voice, uh, which is the number one reason I use the bow. Uh, is just to fight Paul's voice. Uh, otherwise, I'm very much just a shoot the sword beam, or, or don't bother <laughs> with ranged weapons kind of player. Yeah. No, I, I kind of do the same thing. Whenever I have the sword beam available, I just spam it constantly. Um, I, I actually do use the arrows a lot, though, because especially when you get into these denser enemy territories where if you can keep somebody at range and you don't have a sword beam available, arrows are really nice for that because you can kind of keep yourself at a safer distance to not get hit by the unblockable melee attacks, I guess. Um, so I, I do still utilize arrows quite a lot, um, but maybe I'll try to force myself to use the magic wand a bit just to get some utilization out of it. But um, that's <coughs> kind of where I land with it. So this brings us directly into another point of conversation around this dungeon, which is the boss. We're talking about the differences between the magic wand and the bow. Um, and so let's go ahead and talk about our fight with Goma. And I use the term fight. Um, <laughs> I was about to say, can you call it a fight? Because I wouldn't call it a fight. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I think so. I got a text from Matt at like 1130 p.m. last night. Clearly, he was uh, playing his section of game um, and the text <laughs> it literally just said, I think I just one shot Goma, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> I mean, look, here's here's my deal. I said a second ago that I was going to circle back around to the whole economy of damage against bosses. And this is, I think, the time to talk about it. I'll, I'll get into it again in the next dungeon as well. But like I, I think the thing that. Like, obviously, a lot of things are prototypical Zelda in this game. Um, a lot of conventions and the way that things work had not been established yet. I think the one that is the most consistently off-putting to me is the fact that basically every boss in this game so far is just a massive pushover. It's the e So far, the boss has been the easiest <laughs> to beat non-trash mob. Like, blue dark nuts are harder than every single boss we've fought so far, in my opinion. And that's weird to me that the boss of a dungeon would be able to so easily and so consistently be killed with one or two hits. Uh, Manhandla, two hits. Dodongo, or one hit with a bomb if you get lucky. Two hits for Dodongo with a bomb. One hit for Goma. Uh, I mean, like... Even Gleok, like we said, is is a pushover. Aquamentis, the first time around, was not that hard, even with no upgrades whatsoever. Aquamentis in Dungeon 7 is a, a joke. Like, it's so weird to get to the end of a dungeon to the monster that is guarding the treasure that you are seeking in the piece of the Triforce, and it just does not challenge you in any way, shape, or form. Especially this late in the game. Yeah, especially when you get to the last four or five dungeons. And, like, it's just weird. It's just weird. 
I think, uh, and and just in case we didn't make it clear, the way that you beat Goma is you shoot it once in the eye with an arrow, and then it's it's dead. Yeah, it does close its eye. You have to wait for the eye to open. There um, is there is some time definitely, required. Yeah, you definitely can walk into the room and see the eye open and shoot it immediately. Also, uh, <laughs> that happens, which is what I did. I walked in, his eye was open. I went arrow, and it was dead. And I said, "Oh, okay, cool. That that, that was that." One thing that I do think is a little interesting about this is we've had conversations about the extent to which items are necessary or not in this game, right? And a lot of, I think a lot of the ones that we have found are definitely not necessary to certainly defeat the dungeons that they're found in, but definitely not necessary to beat the game. Um, And I think that we had considered the bow and arrow to be one of those items, right? For sure. And... I think kind of where we're at now is that if you were approaching the bow and arrow that way and you get to this boss, I got to imagine you're kind of up a creek, right? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I don't, does anything else damage Goma? I I don't know. Josh, do you know? Not, not that I'm aware of. No. Um, Like (laughs) there are lots of tricks out there, so (laughs) I could be wrong. Maybe someone's figured it out, but um but no, as far as I know, you you have to use an arrow. Um, and that does mean that you have to have thoroughly explored Eagle, uh, even the optional northern wing, or seemingly optional, and you have to have bought arrows at the store. Uh, I guess I'm sort of of two minds about that, because I did like... I mean, we mentioned this with Max last week, that we sort of like the fantasy of this world just being filled with treasure and you don't necessarily need all of it, but it's cool and it's there to find. Um, And I feel like this kind of negates that a little bit. But at the same time, I do think there is a fun thing here where at a certain point, similar to what Matt had to do with his uh, expanded bomb bag from last week, right? he he had to go back into a dungeon for it. I do think there is something kind of fun about getting to an enemy that you can't overcome. You've got a hint, like the old man tells you how to beat this boss. You get there, you can't do it, so now it's time to go exploring again. Right. Um, And and I do think, uh, uh, I think I said something similar to this uh, in the Discord lately, but uh, I think that when when this game came out, there were not tons of games like this, right? Uh, Like I, I know of a handful of predecessors, uh, that were similar top-down adventure style dungeon delving kind of games. Uh, but I suspect that given the just completely open with very little information nature of the game, you can end up in most of the dungeons as your first dungeon. Uh, and it's like it's really easy to end up in dungeon two or three as your first dungeon. Uh, and so it's possible, it's very, very possible for a player to have gotten to this dungeon and never found Eagle at all. Uh, I also think it's likely that people played where they went into a dungeon and didn't necessarily finish it. They did part of a dungeon and then left. It was too hard. They didn't have the step ladder. You know, they, they hit a dead end and left and went into another dungeon. Uh, and then it wasn't just about going back to get the bomb bag upgrade you missed. It was that you've been just kind of dungeon delving a little bit here and there, getting different things, uh, which which also goes into the key conversation of you can run out of keys and have to go buy more at the store uh, if you've mixed and matched your dungeons too much. Uh, so I, I suspect there were more players doing that than we would think, uh, but e- even for me, I grew up in more an era where the games were more linear you, you play a game and you beat a level and you go to another level and you go to another level. You don't beat half of one level and then skip to half of another level and do half of five levels and then go back and finish the first level. Can I just and say... in this game, you can do that. Yeah. Can I just say to that point that even though we consider this a very weird way of dungeon diving in a Zelda game, Thinking about our conversation at the end of the Breath of the Wild season about what we want from dungeons in Breath of the Wild 2, I can see this mentality being applied in that way and it being very fun. Like, imagine a Breath of the Wild style world 
where the dungeons are just existing spaces like this. And you can get into them in some level in any order that you want. Uh, and then, yeah, like you just have to kind of piecemeal them. Like you explore a little bit of one. You have to leave to go get something and come back. You go tackle another one. I, I just, I think that this is actually a mentality that could actually apply very well to uh, a, a much more modern style of Zelda game and be really fun. Yeah, they actually, uh, they experimented with it just a tiny bit uh, in Skyward Sword where you go back to Skyview Temple and you're able to kind of access areas in different ways that you or that you couldn't get to before. Uh, you have to you get to dig out the key that like that spot is there when you're there the first time, but you can't do anything with it, and you have to go back. Uh, you know, the, yeah, if you know you have to do it, you can go get the water ahead of time and skip it. But uh, but like they didn't they didn't go all the way with the idea, but they clearly had the idea of like we could reuse these spaces and like expand on them if you had to make a return trip uh, in some way. Uh, so I, I think that idea is still in the Zelda team to I, do something with it. I uh, I definitely see your observation and agree with it, with the big caveat that uh, that section of Skyward Sword is one that Matt and I roosted heavily. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's not a section of Skyward Sword that I like either, uh, but... Uh, uh, it doesn't help that it's right after the imprisoned fight and then climbing the tree or doing the first silent realm, climbing the tree and then going to Lake Floria. Like it's just, it's a big slog section of the game. Uh, but if they did it in a smarter way, like we're saying where you, you revisit a dungeon, but because you've been to these other dungeons, uh, it, it opens up in a, in a natural way again, uh, that would, uh, just to use a generic term, it would kind of make it more like a Metroidvania where in Metroid, you would go back and revisit with your new items and just find whole new areas uh, of a dungeon in this case. So I have a kind of a timeline question that maybe I should know if I did research for this podcast at all, which I don't do, but uh, did Metroid come out before Zelda or did Zelda come out before Metroid? <sighs> It's roughly the same time period, um, but I think Metroid came out first. Uh, I'm actually just going to look it up. I'm doing the same thing. It's so uh, weird because this was an era, Matt, where – I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast before, but this was an era where these games were all released on very different timelines in Japan before they ever came to the U.S. Right. Um, like, I, I know famously, it's very difficult for people to nail down the exact release date of Super Mario Brothers mm -hmm. for that reason. Like, uh, I, got I, it. I don't think anyone 100% knows what the actual on-sale date was for Super Mario Brothers. Um, because we think of it now in terms of, like, we have a release date and we're all waiting for it and it all comes out basically everywhere on the same day, right? Right. And But w w with these original NES games, um, that was very much not the case. Uh, that's fair. But because we continually kind of come back to this explore, get a new item, go explore again get a new item, go explore again. Like this, this back and forth and this circular pattern of um, re-exploration is very Metroid. But is it Metroid or is it Zelda? And is Metroid Zelda? Like it, it's which, which is first, right? Or do they just maybe take heavy inspiration from each other? Like, so I think it's, I think that's kind of a key question in how we classify this type of, uh, overworld and dungeon exploration. So Wikipedia tells me that The Legend of Zelda was released on February 21st of 86 and Metroid was released on August 6th of 1986. So uh, realistically, they were all kind of in development around the same time, right? Um, and uh, notably Metroid and Kid Icarus are like the same game uh, with slightly different <laughs> gameplay style. Uh and, uh, and I believe Super Mario Brothers was kind of being developed while Zelda is being developed also. Uh, so it's like they, they're just playing with a whole lot of ideas. Um, and it all just kind of, it all just kind of happened. Uh, but 86 is kind of when all of those things happened. Yeah. Yeah. So let's put a pin in this discussion and come back to it 
later if it becomes applicable in the future. Let's move on to Dungeon Seven, which is Demon, uh, the one that you've got to tra- the one that you've got to drain the lake for. Um, I think that there is. I think personally myself, I was a lot more challenged by this dungeon than by dungeon six. Um, I think the layout of this dungeon is so interesting because compared to a lot of the other ones that we played so far, uh, it is, it's dense. Like it is a highly dense dungeon. Um, lots of rooms that interconnect with other rooms, lots of rooms that can, you can bomb your way into another room. Um, lots of rooms that you straight up don't need to go into. Um, I think there's a lot of key loading that happens in this dungeon. Like it seems like they wanted to give you an opportunity to really load up on keys. If that was a thing that you needed to do. Um, but yeah, I guess Josh, give me your impressions on demon. Uh, well, first I'm surprised you just immediately say it's more challenging. Uh, I think a lot of people think that six is, maybe even the most difficult or just like a big difficulty jump uh, because of things like uh, the rooms full of whiz robes with like likes with bubbles. Uh, it's just a horrible combination. <laughs> um, but this dungeon, uh, like I actually did have a little bit of trouble because I had rushed through and not gotten the bomb bag upgrades. Uh, so there's just a lot, like you said, a lot of walls to bomb. Uh, so it is a little more free flowing of, uh, choose your own path to some extent. Um, uh, something else I noticed uh, is just that you you fight a lot of bosses uh, throughout it, which is just very different than the others. There's a lot of repeat, like they're mini bosses, right? But yeah. a lot of repeat encounters with the Dongos and Dick Dogger. Uh, and Goma. Which you don't really see elsewhere. Oh, is there a Goma? Or, or sorry, not a Goma, uh, Moldorm. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think to to my count, you fight Dig Dogger three times. Um, there is a Dodongo room with three Dodongos, and that one is actually really tricky because you've got fireballs that are shooting at you while you're trying to deal with the Dodongos. Actually, I think the smartest way to tackle that room is to just bomb your way into the next one and go right past it. Um, I, I, <laughs> like seriously, yeah, you don't actually have to fight them. It's kind of a trick. Uh. Like you can, you can save yourself a lot of trouble and a lot of bombs by just not engaging with those Dodongos in that room. (laughs) Yeah. Like I, I think that I personally found dungeon six more challenging just because exactly like Josh said, there are multiple rooms where you have four or five whiz robes, two or three like likes, two bubbles and just tons of going on that almost killed me multiple times. Um, so I thought Dungeon 6 was more challenging from an enemy perspective. Dungeon 7 was um, more challenging from a how do I get where I need to go perspective. And I think a lot of that was the breadth of exploration you can do in all of these rooms. And if you don't have the map or you don't have a map up, it's very easy to get lost in demon. And I think that that was challenging in a different type of way, but combat wise, I did not find demon very challenging. Like the, I think there are three dig dodgers in here that you have to fight. Yeah. And you know, they're not necessarily super challenging, especially when you know that you have to use the flute on them. This, these are different from the original dig dodger in that they split into three tiny eyes Mm -hmm. instead of one eye so that was a little bit interesting uh the most challenging room though to me in demon was the one where you have to push the block to open the staircase and Mm -hmm. i was trying to do that for a long time before realizing that you have to kill all the wall hands and i was having such a really hard time killing the wall hands because i kept getting hit by stupid bubbles and the wall hands were coming out of walls all over the place and it was it was making that room was difficult for me i think the rest of the dungeon was really not such of a much out side of just trying to figure out where to go and how to progress. Yeah, yeah that room I, that room where you push the block with the wall masters is also uh, uh, just frustrating because if you get caught by a wall master or if you die because you get hit by the bubbles too much or whatever, um, that uh, that is the furthest point from the entrance. Like, you got to start over. Which is another instance of like Thank God for save states, right? I mean, I, uh, I I was similarly having a difficult time in this room, and I got picked up once by a wall master, 
And I sat there and thought about it for a second and was like, you know what? Screw it. Rewind. Like, I I don't mind taking my hits where I deserve them, but also I wasn't about to just like go all the way back through the dungeon just on principle. Yeah, that's that's I, I did the same thing. I got grabbed by a wall hand once or twice and was like, nope, not doing that. Just uh. Uh-uh. I think that one of the other th- really interesting things that happens in this dungeon is that so we've got an item that we've seen in shops around Hyrule, right, which is the bait. And I, as far as I'm aware, the bait does not do anything except for in this one instance. Is that correct, Josh? Uh, it, you can lay it on the ground in the overworld, and it attracts enemies to it. Oh, that's cool. So uh, then you can just kill them that from that afar, really I guess. has any practical use other than, like, I guess it distracts the enemies so they're not attacking you, right? So it just makes them uh, monkeys in a barrel. Uh, but uh, but uh, aside from that, it's just, you know, you need it here. There's not a great reason to buy it other and, than for this. Well, that's the thing. Like, yes, it's cool. I don't know that it's 100 rupees cool. Yeah. I, and actually, Is I had 80 a, rupees cool. Oh, uh, nah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and pr- I think that's the cheapest price you can find is 80 rupees. Gotcha. Uh, but we have another instance here where we've got this hungry gorilla who, you know, we y- you give him the bait and you can't progress through the dungeon without doing that. At least as far as I'm aware, is there a way to kind of bypass that? No, no, you have to do that. Yeah, as far as I, I, I even looking at the map right now, I do not believe there's a way to the north half of the dungeon without it. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think it's so interesting because here we have another example of like impassable area unless you have one super specific thing, and uh, and yeah, it's another instance of like I don't know how evident it is from the gorilla just saying grumble grumble that this is what you're supposed to do, you know? Yeah, I was actually looking at the manual right now to see if it said anything about it, uh, but it really doesn't. Uh, yeah, it tells it you what it does, uh, but the, about it being bait for enemies. Uh, but uh, but no, I, I don't know what great way there is. Uh, like, the, the grumble grumble is... Honestly, probably like a poor translation issue. Uh, like it's, it's supposed to be like his stomach is growling, right? It's supposed right. to sound like he's hungry. Uh, but it's uh, all pretty much all of the dialogue in this game runs into the the character limitation on the NES of that you can say more with fewer characters in Japanese often than you can say in English. Uh, and I don't know exactly what it says in Japanese, <laughs> But uh, I feel like maybe it's easier to understand. Uh, Did you get hung up on this at all, Matt? No, because of our wonderful friend, Phil. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have gone into this dungeon multiple times without the bait. Like, I know that it's in one of these dungeons, right? But I still... Like, I don't always reference a guide. I'm just playing the game or whatever. And sometimes I do forget. And you get halfway through the dungeon. It was like, oh, it was this one. <laughs> and then you have to leave and come back. Yeah, that would be frustrating. I can, I can see that being frustrating. Luckily, I did not because um, I think, let me let me go look back at the official game guide. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Because the official game guide has the bait listed as an item, and I'm trying to remember what its description was. Da, 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 da. Here it is. Enemy bait. Link can use this bait uh, to lure the enemy and bump them off as they come to eat it, but watch out. This is, Okay, never mind. So this was not a part of the official game guide. Uh, I guess it was just from Phil's guide of I knew that I was going to need bait at some point to progress in a dungeon, so I bought it when I first found it and just kept it until I ran into this enemy. Or person thing. Well, that was, that was definitely good thinking on your part because I... Um, previous to now like i'm not reading ahead in the guide or anything and i have definitely seen the bait in shops before and not bought it just because i thought to myself like there's no way like it didn't occur to me that this was anything other than um some like something that did basically what josh is saying it does in the overworld which is like it makes 
mob combat easier, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I didn't buy it for that reason. So um, I did have to leave the dungeon and go find a shop and pick me up some bait and come back. Sucks. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it, it, it's fine. Like I'm that that's clearly like you know, the the people designing this game knew that that was a possible journey that you might have to go on. And uh and yeah, even though it's like an obstacle an immediate obstacle in your progression, I'm willing to go on that on that journey, I guess. Like I wasn't too put out by having to do it. So still something that I think is is really interesting. I think uh um, off the top of my head, I can think of some other things that have been done in later Zelda games that are kind of like this, but maybe it had better like signposting or better clues that this is what you had to do. Um, but I think, uh, again, in its earliest iteration, this is the way that this first game in the series chose to tackle it. And, uh, and yeah, definitely something that has evolved <laughs> since, since this time, um, of course the item that we get in this dungeon, I would say is pound for pound far more useful than the one we got in the last dungeon. I love infinite fire usage. No doubt. Yeah. Not having to leave a screen and come back to cast fire from a candle is amazing. So for that reason alone, I think the red candle is probably one of my favorite things that I've picked up so far. I do think it's really fun and interesting that there aren't too many rooms in this dungeon after you get the red candle that like require you to use it. You know, there's not like actually a whole lot of dark rooms in this one. Yeah. That was interesting is you don't actually use this item at all. So that was that was a little odd. But I know going into the overworld, I can burn trees with impunity. Not that I think I have much left to find by burning trees, uh, but I can do it if I so choose, which is fun. Yeah, this is the point where, especially in the 80s, when you if you don't have a whole map to just tell you where stuff is, it's like now now burning bushes to actually find secrets becomes not a complete waste of time. <laughs> um, which means that maybe for the first time you find some of those, uh, it's a secret to everybody, here's 100 rupees kind of moblins uh, because you don't have to waste all of your time uh, burning one bush and leaving and coming back and trying another one of the 100 bushes on the screen. Uh, so I feel like if we were playing a different way, this is where like overworld exploration would really open up. Yeah. Uh, in a, in a different way. Definitely. So I guess, is there anything else that we want to say about dungeon seven? Because I know at the very end of the dungeon discussion, we usually come around to the boss and talk about what that experience was like, but I barely had an experience with this boss. So <laughs> I mean, like, look, we, we fight Aquamentus again and I, I don't is this is this version of Aquamentus even slightly different than the very first time no. we fought him? Uh it might be slightly different in that you enter the room from the left instead of from the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the little things. <laughs> uh, but no, I think the I think the fight is kind of more Symbolic. I think Matt said something about it in the plot recap that it's like it's it's kind of showing you how far you've come. Like you fight him again, it's like wow, it was it, it was uh, way easier now than it was then. Whether that's really true or not, uh, I don't know. But because uh, I, I think he has like three hits regardless. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of showing you, look, you can still you can overcome this easier than you did six dungeons ago. I think it's so funny because I walked into this room. I had full hearts at the end of the dungeon and I just fired off three sword beams and the, the whole thing was done. I think it was all done in, in three seconds, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have full hearts, so I did not fire off sword beams. I walked right up to him, blocked a fireball and went swipe, swipe, swipe and Dunsky. So, not much longer than three seconds, but. So with that being said, um, do we have anything else that we want to say about Demon before we move, before we move on? Everyone good? I'm good. 
Okay, that sounds great. Well, let's go ahead and move on to part four, which is bloopy trails, where we talk about things that diverted our attention this week. Very quick rundown for me. I did get the power bracelets. I did get the magic sword. Um, I actually did not get any other heart pieces uh, this week. I, it, you know, I, I just didn't do quite as much exploration and i i don't know uh, this is the only week where i haven't done that I, I i'm still trying to figure out whether or not it's my goal to get all heart pieces before i go beat this game i think i probably will just because that seems like a simpler task here than it normally is yeah are you for sure. sure that you don't already have them all that's actually a great question i don't know how many heart pieces there are in this game <laughs> there are five then I think I might have them There's all. There's a really solid chance that I have them I think, all. I'm pretty sure it's five. One, two, three. Yeah, there are five. And you can you can get three of them before you go into the first dungeon. And then you need the raft for one and the step ladder for one. I think that I have them all. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure I have them all. Okay. <laughs> Yay! Knocked it out without even trying. Isn't that great? Hooray. <laughs> it is not difficult to 100% this game. I mean, what would, is there is there anything at all that is even slightly challenging from that perspective? I mean, if you don't know where where everything is, right? It's like, how do you know to burn the right bush to find a heart container? How do you know to bomb an exact wall to find a heart container? Like, one of the walls is kind of suspicious. The other one is just the beachfront. Yeah. Uh, you know, so... Uh, it's really more of just the knowledge has just been it's readily available to us now in a way it wouldn't have been you know no one designing this game knew we would still be talking about it 35 years later yeah i think that's a totally fair point and we really do have to keep that perspective in mind when we're talking about this stuff um matt did you uh, bloopy trail anything I mean, I think my main bloopy trail would be getting the magic sword and the power bracelet because that's like really what I spent time doing outside of the dungeons. Um, So, yeah, there you go. What about yourself, Josh? No, I I went through all those same motions. Uh, You know, I I went out of my way to get the power bracelet. I usually get it later, actually. Uh, But I saw I saw that Bill's guide suggested getting it. so I went out of the way to get it. Um, and, uh, cause it is just one of those things I just check off my list. It's not, I don't really use it. Um, and, uh, but going to get the magical sword, uh, I went out and got a magic shield. I don't, I don't even always buy one of those. Uh, uh, but I, I went ahead and got one and, uh, but those are just kind of the things you do in this game. That actually is. But I didn't go out of my way to try and make money or anything. (laughs) Right. It's a little surprising hearing that you never go out of your way to get the magic shield, just because I would say that that's one of those things that I do find to be pretty useful on like a moment to moment basis in this game, especially as more things like start shooting at you. You know. No, it's it definitely can be useful, right? Um, Part of uh, this is kind of a a a trick. Um, Um. it's really maybe easy to explain with the the ropes. Uh, ropes dash at you when you stand right in front of them. But if you stand on like if you're on the tile floor of a dungeon and you stand on a crack, they won't dash at you. Whiz robes kind of work the same way. They don't shoot at you if you're not directly in front of them. Uh, and so I tend to just try and do that and stay out of their line of sight uh, instead of relying on a shield. Uh, so a lot of times I just don't feel like going out of my way to, or spending the money on the shield, but it is a very good item. Gotcha. Well, let's go ahead and get into part five, which is Z targeting, where we lock on to fascinating characters or enemies that we happen to cross. Uh, I'm going to go first. I'm going to give my my what has now become my customary enemy pick of the week because that's really all we have to, to go off of in this game. Um, the whiz robes were mine. Um, I think that it's really cool that... Of all the enemies that are in this game, I think that especially when you fight Wizards in top-down games, they kind of tend to always be like this, you know? Um, 
I, I think that the exception is the way that the blue whiz robes move and operate. But for the most part, especially in like Link's Awakening, you know, the whiz robes, they operate the same way that the red ones do here where they you walk into a room, they warp in and then they shoot at you and then they disappear and then they warp up in another place. But they're stationary. Um, the blue ones actually kind of like move around and are somewhat of a pain in the ass in this game. They really were obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I oh and man, those are actually the ones I was talking about trying to stay out of their line of sight because yeah, the red ones just show up and shoot a laser. Uh, but I think that it's it's definitely I think one of the things that's been the most fun to me playing this early game is just taking a catalog mentally of which enemies haven't really changed that much throughout the entire course of the series. And the whiz robes are definitely one of those. Um, and it, it, it was definitely kind of fun and familiar to see them for the first time here. Matt, do you have a Z targeting pick? The hungry Goria. He's just an interesting dude. He's so hungry. He's so hungry, uh, which, you know, I can appreciate. And also I appreciate that after we fed him, he did not try to kill us. So good on you. He has manners. Yeah, I like I really like Phil's illustration of this Guria because he basically just looks like Mm -hmm. like (laughs) I I think this is the face Gatsby would make if I handed him like a whole rump roast. Yeah, he'd just be like, yeah, no, it'd be awesome. I would love that. (laughs) We should do that sometime like on his birthday. I think we should name the hungry Guria. We do have a tendency of naming things. Uh, What do you think? He looks kind of (laughs) like. Do you think Harold? I think maybe maybe a nice Harold. I was thinking Scooby. Well, that's just that's <laughs> derivative. That's derivative. You can't do that. Okay. <laughs> Don't be derivative. My bad. My bad. Sure. Why not? Harold the Hungry Guria. There you, you go. You get your way, Matt. I was love it, it. Was it worth it? Yes. It's always worth it. Whenever I get my way. Cool. Always worth it. Neat. Josh, do you have a Z targeting pick for this week? I'm gonna go with Goma. Uh Maybe for the unconventional reason of, uh, like it is, it's it's seeing a first iteration of something that is now a famous Zelda enemy uh, that actually doesn't appear uh, like I, they show up in Link's Awakening as an optional mini boss, right? But like made famous by Queen Goma in Ocarina of Time, uh, and it's it's an example of kind of the opposite of what you said with Wiz Robes, where they haven't changed very much. Goma has evolved a lot uh, to become from here just a pushover to now like a prominent like recurring Zelda boss that you you kind of expect to see a yeah. Goma in a Zelda game. Yeah. And this is something that we actually mentioned in our Link's Awakening season as well when we realized that in Catfish's Maw there are Goma that are mini bosses. Um and they look very similar to this mm-hmm. Goma in this game. Um, and they are like, you kind of fight them in a very similar way, but, uh, in both that game and this one, what they really look like is just very big tech tights. Yeah. That's, that's really yeah, what they look they, like. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and really like, even in some of the other games, like Goma has been like a spider uh, and it is kind of a spider here. It, it's maybe more like a crab or a lobster kind of thing. Um, but, uh, like Queen Goma and Ocarina of Time is less spider-like uh, than the Goma in Twilight Princess, which is an obvious spider. Yeah, Ar- Armagoma, I think is what that one's called, right? Yes, yeah, Armagoma, yeah. Yeah, so definitely a little bit of evolution there. But yeah, so uh, definitely what you're saying, kind of the inverse of what we were talking about with the Wizards, where yes, this this enemy has been on a ride throughout the course of the whole series. Um, definitely not my favorite iteration of it here in this game. Uh, it, it went on Probably to bigger the and better things. iteration. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair. Yeah, it's definitely the most pushover iteration. I don't know if I would snuggle it, but I guess it's a little cuter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Cool. All right. Well, that takes us, of course, into part six of the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is our final thoughts, in which we let Matt wrap up this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can think to do. Matt, it's all you. 
Uh, this section of game more or less brings to conclusion our exploration of the overworld of Hyrule. We have found most of the objects. We've upgraded all the things we can upgrade outside of dungeons. We've really been to every corner of the map except for the very last piece, which is the Death Mountain Crater. Um, we have gone on a pretty wild ride with Link to upgrade our power to the point that uh, fighting the first boss from the first dungeon really was more of a joke than a challenge. Um, so as we come to the last uh, two dungeons in the game after this, uh, we have really set ourselves up uh, for success to go into uh, the final confrontation with Ganon. And um, it's been a fun ride, much more so than I think we anticipated. And uh, very excited to see uh, this journey through to its conclusion next week. Us having one more episode of this game left to go really snuck up on me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which is good. And of course, we'll rank it again before we so move on to So technically two, two more but, episodes. Yeah, okay, but but yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. It, came, it came quick and fast, and it's been, uh, it's been a good time. This brings us to the end of the Sacred Realms Rundown. We will, of course, be back next week with another installment of the Sacred Realms Rundown, where we tackle the final dungeon, <laughs> and then Death Mountain, and finally... Ganon. We have one or two more things that we want to bring up before we get out of here for the week, as has been our custom lately. Uh, we hit our Discord up and uh, solicited them for questions for the guests that we have on for the evening. Um, and we've got one or two of those things uh, to put forth to Josh before we get out of here. Before we do that, small order of business. Uh Y'all have heard on this show once or twice before uh, we've name dropped our intrepid Discord admin, Haru the Mighty, loyal patron, and uh, really the person who helped us get the Discord um, up off the ground. Uh, you know, I, I think she was primarily responsible for this happening in the first place. Um, and so obviously she's done more than enough work uh, for us for no compensation whatsoever uh, to where we're very grateful uh, to have her around. Um that being said, she still found it within the goodness of her heart to make a little donation to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast, which was not at all required. Uh, and we were flabbergasted that she um, that she felt the need to do that. We we're so incredibly thankful. Um, so, of course, that money is going to go to helping us with production costs on this whole batch of Breath of the Wild cards that are currently in printing and will be going out in the mail as soon as they arrive on my doorstep. Um, Y'all are getting a whole lot of cards all at one time, so look forward to that. But uh, Matt and I also made a small expenditure... <laughs> Uh, with that donation um, that uh, that we felt would help us to elevate the mood of of our next uh, podcast uh, in which we were able to enjoy it. So, Haru, uh, just wanted to let you know, Matt and I went and we purchased a very nice whiskey that we have been partaking in while recording this episode. Uh, for anyone who's interested in this kind of thing, this is the 2022 release of Woodford uh, Reserve's Batch Proof. Um, which they put out every year and is incredibly limited. Uh, it is a delicious high proof whiskey. We're enjoying it very much. Uh, thank you so much, Haru. We, uh, we owe you quite a lot. Um, you're going to have a whole entire batch of cards as any of the ones that we have up until now come in your way. Um, in addition to that, I would just like to offer a toast to Haru the mighty cheers to Haru cheers to Haru. You're great. Absolutely. Um, in addition to that, we are celebrating uh, something that snuck up on us as well, which is uh, as of the recording of this episode on what is today, August 31st. 2022 we released our 75th episode today this is obviously we were recording on the day so this episode will release next week but so this the one you're listening to now will be our 76th episode uh but all of that just kind of aligns really well and uh we as always want to shout out and our appreciation to all of the wonderful people that have supported us along the way um we are averaging over 1500 downloads a week now between our podcasts uh various podcast networks and the wonderful Zelda universe YouTube. Um, and we just really, really want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in, listening and supporting us along the way. Um, Linda and I never in our wildest dreams thought that we would be, uh, having, a. a 
reaching that many people week over week. And we just appreciate you guys so much for um, tuning in and listening and supporting us along this journey and, and making this uh, not just a, a really fulfilling hobby, but something that we can do to, uh, you know, kind of a self-sustaining, not money pit type of hobby, right? Like yeah. it's uh, we're <laughs> our, his wife and my girlfriend are not hounding us about wasting money on a podcast. It's uh, at the very least self-sustaining. So thank you guys. Oh, so much for all the support and, uh, Hopefully, many, many, many more episodes to come, but 75 is a big milestone that we felt the need to celebrate. The, so. the climb towards 100 starts here. Absolutely. Only 25 to go. We're three quarters of the way there. So before we get out of here, uh, we do have a few things that we want to ask Josh. We've gotten one or two things from the uh, Discord, and so I'm going to hit you with a few real quick, Josh. Does that sound good? Sure. I have not been reading the Discord while we're recording, so I have no idea what they are. So the uh, the first comes from Cody Davies, a friend of yours, of friend of ours, who uncharacteristically asked a serious question and then a not serious question. <clears throat> so uh, very uncharacteristic for him. His serious question is, Josh, where in your ranking does Zelda 1 fall? Number 10 out of 19. Okay. What is immediately above it and immediately below it? Uh, immediately above it is uh, going to make Matt upset. <laughs> <laughs> his Majora's Mask. Uh, oh, number whoa. Nine. Number nine is Majora. <laughs> mm, Josh. Uh, and uh, and then number 11 is A Link Between Worlds. Okay, cool, cool. Um, good to know. I think, I think A Legend of Zelda and Link Between Worlds, I think a lot of people would probably have them in those slots <laughs> on their list. Uh, I also esteem Majora's Mask a bit more highly than that, but uh, hey, that's I the used great to. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Like I said, my list fluctuates as I replay games, and uh, I, I replayed uh, I'm going on a slight tangent, but I replayed it twice last year. I played the 3DS version and came off it kind of eh, and so I played the N64 version, and it did not really change my mind. Uh, and it was soon after Skyward Sword HD had come out, uh, which made me like that game a lot more. Uh, and uh, so Skyward Sword got a nice bump up, and Majora's Mask uh, had a bit of a fall from grace. <laughs> We've heard uh, we've heard several people say that about Skyward Sword HD, and uh, I'm definitely glad that that's kind of been the the overarching sentiment um, for that game. I think that it was due for a reexamination, and I think the Switch uh, re-release. Matt and I both agree uh, more than did justice to the to that whole experience. So good stuff there. Uh, Cody's less serious question is: Josh, is your full name Josh Amillion or Josh Amus? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with Joshimus. Yes. Uh, just to go with the gladiator <laughs> reference there. Gotcha. I'm not half as cool as him, but <laughs> but I'm going to go with it anyway. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to introduce Joshimus from ZU. So, Joshimus. There you go. <laughs> All righty. And we've got one as well from Haru the Mighty. And she asks, how would you compare Breath of the Wild to Zelda 1? Um, and also, do you wish if they had had the tech at the time that there had been more story elements in Zelda one? Um, as far as how, how do I compare them? That's a, that's a big question. Uh, like they, they do have, uh, I, it has already been established. They clearly went back and examined what they did, uh, in Zelda one to make, essentially make Zelda one again with modern technology. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, yeah, I prefer playing Breath of the Wild nowadays, uh, over The Legend of Zelda. Uh, but, uh, as far as how I compare it otherwise, it's like, uh, I, The Legend of Zelda is an easier pick up and play game for me, but I grew up with, uh, older games. Like I grew up with a Super Nintendo. Um, uh, but, uh. Yeah, I don't know how else to, to go with that without making like an hour long conversation <laughs> and that's, examining all that's the bits fair. of it. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as more story elements, I mean, sure. Like it'd be nice to see some of the backstory actually presented in the game. Uh, 
Like, I, I don't know how much more story the game really needs to tell what it's telling. Um, but, but you'd lose a lot of the context that's stuck in the manual, uh, with, since it's not really presented in game, uh, and there are no towns, uh, you know, every, every Zelda game after this has people you can talk to that tell you more things than little one-liners, uh, and that kind of flesh out the world more. Uh, so yeah, there's a benefit, there's a benefit to it for sure that it would, it could improve the game. Um, uh, I, I'm pretty wary of saying that I want this game remade. I really don't. Uh, I think these, I think these original games that started it, like Super Mario Brothers, is a good example too. I feel like they should just kind of be left alone <laughs> to be what they are, as like the foundation that started it, and and not try to to change it. We mentioned Metroid Zero Mission last week. Do you feel like? Uh-huh. Do you feel the same way about Metroid? And do you feel like Metroid Zero Mission is? <clears throat> was not necessarily a completely worthy endeavor for that reason. Uh, that one, uh, it's a little weird for me uh, because I had never, I never finished Metroid one until last year, actually, uh, which is a uh, completely Metroid dreads fault. Uh, I was re- I replayed all of the first four zero mission Samus returns and super Metroid infusion before dread came out but Dread had not come out yet, and I still really wanted to play Metroid. <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I'm going to do this finally. Uh, and I actually used Phil's guide, uh, uh, I think. Maybe that came out later. I used a map. I had a good map uh, because Metroid doesn't have a map at all on the NES. Uh, and once you have a map, the game becomes a lot more playable. <laughs> uh, so that game is... Uh, I feel like Metroid has aged a lot worse but also Metroid has a uh, it has a st- a really really important part of the story stuck in it uh, in a way the Legend of Zelda doesn't like uh, as much as I will talk of, I could let start again I like talking about the timeline a lot but you don't need the timeline for Zelda stories to make sense uh, it's more of a fun side activity to talk about how Ocarina of Time connects to the Wind Waker and to Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess, and to A Link to the Past, and you can piece it all together. You can take any one of those games completely out of the timeline, and you have a full-fledged story. Uh, Metroid is a more linear timeline <laughs> of stories. Uh, and if you take the first part out of the story, then it's why is Samus on SR388 killing all the Metroids? And why did you go back to Zebus? And why are there all these destroyed facilities? Like it, you start to lose like chapters of a book uh, that you've just ripped out. And so when they took Zero Mission and redid it, they rewrote that chapter to actually make it fit with the narrative that they had established since then. Uh, and so I do like that remake a lot, uh, but I have a very strong appreciation for Metroid 1 on the NES now that I've actually played it uh, completely. Uh, I think it actually is really fun. It just needs a map. <laughs> did uh, did you enjoy Dread? Matt and I really both did. Oh, yeah. Although, no, I love Metroid. I love Metroid. Yeah. Yep. Cool, I, cool. Sorry, I think I cut you off there. Oh, I was going to say, I actually started playing it a second time, like immediately after I started it, after I finished it. Uh, so, yeah, I couldn't put it down. Yep, yep. It's a it's a really great one, and I'll probably come back around to it at some point before too long as well. Definitely a very bright spot in, uh, in the recent Nintendo release catalog. So, yep, couldn't agree more, Josh. Uh, excellent answers to all of these questions. Uh, thank you, Cody and Haru, for writing in and giving us something to talk about here at the end of the episode. Josh, this has been a really fun one. We really appreciate you coming on to talk about The Legend of Zelda. I know that uh, in some ways the main event for you is going to be when we get to Zelda 2 um, and really can't wait to have your perspective on that game. Um, just Like, I think Matt and I have always felt like more than any other game in the catalog, Zelda 2 was going to put our initial premise of there are no bad Zelda games to the test. 
um, for us personally. So really, really can't wait to hash that out and to have some, some discussions about kind of where we're landing with it and then to get your perspectives on it as well. Yeah, I'm excited and optimistic after seeing how much you actually enjoyed Zelda 1 uh, so far. I, I was expecting a lot more negative negativity in these episodes. <laughs> well, I'm glad that if nothing else, we were <laughs> relentlessly positive. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, we were expecting more negativity as well, and it's been very refreshing to not, you know, have that. We, we're just as pleasantly Zelda. surprised as anybody else. Yep. Zelda 2 is just a Metroid game, but Samus has to hit things with her fist instead of shooting lasers. Well, okay. Hmm. That's, an, that's an interesting thought to bring forward. But we will, of course, get more into those thoughts and feelings as we get into that game. We've got a little bit more Legend of Zelda to take care of before that happens. We'll be back next week to talk about that. We're going to be welcoming the brothers, Ben and Pat of Hyrule Podcasters, back on the show to talk about this. Wait, we need to redo that. Ben and Pat of Hyrule Podcasters. There it is. Cool. Can't wait to have those guys back on. They are a blast and a half, and it's been a minute. So they are long overdue for their return to the show. Going to be a fun one next week, y'all. Josh, um, do you want to drop any links or social channels or anywhere that uh, you would like to direct anybody to follow you before we get out of here? Uh, Sure, yeah. If you want to... Follow all the things I do. Uh, It's not just Zelda Universe. Uh, You can follow me. I'm on Twitter primarily, uh, at Watcher Joshua. Uh, And uh, most of what I do is at ZeldaUniverse.net, but I got a whole bunch of other projects as well. Excellent. Well, again, thank you. We'll catch up with you again before too long. Uh, Before that happens, Matt, I think we got to outro this episode and uh, GTFO for the evening. Sound good to you? Let's do it. All righty, y'all. If you enjoyed today's show and you would like a little extra Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod and become a patron if you've got no rupees. That's not a problem. Five-star Apple Podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show, and that makes us very happy, Hylians. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at sacredrealmspod for updates on the podcast and for behind the scenes action sacred realms will be back next wednesday with our thoughts on the legend of zelda chapter five we'd love for you to play along with us and to share your thoughts on our social channels the legend of zelda can be played in a variety of places can be played on the nintendo entertainment system on the uh, nintendo nes mini it can be played on a variety of e-shops although uh you can no longer get it on what it was it was it the wii u and 3ds e-shops are now closed for business yep as of yesterday yeah um, <laughs> Matt and I both managed to snag copies of the Oracle games on the 3DS uh, before, just in case they don't come to the Switch yeah just before the shutdown happens so there you go uh, regardless there are lots of places that you can play this game of course you can play it on the Nintendo Switch NES online service which is the version that Matt and I are playing but in the meantime may your hearts be full may your arrows never miss we will catch y'all next week Sacred Realms is an independent podcast production, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Our music comes from Zelda and Chill by Mikkel and is graciously provided to us by Mikkel and Game Chops Records. Zelda and Chill is available to stream on Spotify or to purchase directly from GameChops.com. Finally, our thanks go to Nintendo for creating such exceptional and innovative experiences.